Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry and uses the imaginary Airzatz Coffee Shop as its platform to bring you a conversation about a plethora of scintillating topics. We don't shy away from any issue that is plaguing our culture or the church today, whether it's current cultural issues, questions about Bible verses, or even just some banter to encourage you. Dr. Jay Christensen is the Truth Barista, and he and amazing Larry Kutzler brew up highly caffeinated conversations for our day. Grab a cup of joe, pop yourself down in the booth next to us, and get ready to think. The Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry, and it's listener-supported. For more information about The Truth Barista, go to highbeamministry.com. Thanks for listening. Health is the most hated truth in the world today. Most gospel ministers don't preach about it. Many gospel preachers don't believe it anymore. They say it's incompatible with the preaching of God's love. They say, how can a God of mercy send anybody to a burning pit of everlasting hell? But Jesus was the very first to warn of hell. He said, whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Jesus warned Capernaum, Bethsaida, and everyone who reject his word, he said, you shall be brought down to hell. Jesus said, you serpents, generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Jesus preached more about hell than he did about heaven. Jesus was the greatest preacher on hell in all this living word. This is The Truth Barista, honest conversations that define the truth for everyday life. Dr. J, we're back in the anointed booth, and I see you have your anointed pen because you just dropped it on the ground. Is is that the pen that you write all these wonderful notes and things with? Yes, and all of your job duties here at the uh, imaginary Airzatz coffee shop where you serve in the back room as the kitchen manager, and we, or actually myself, has served as the manager up front. And that was a lot of fun we had when we had this as a podcast, right. uh, this imaginary coffee shop, and we'd sit down in this anointed booth once a week, and we'd talk through scriptures between the breakfast and lunch crowd, and it was a lot of fun, all this radio theater that we had going. So, you know, if our listeners hear us spout off about this stuff, they'll go, oh, I know what they're talking about now, yes. <laughs> Well, we're going to talk about some great things today out of uh, chapter 9 of the book of Revelation. That's what we're in. We're in this series that we're going to do. We're going pretty slow through it, which is a good idea. And if people wanted to catch some of the other episodes we have done, they can go where? Well, they can go to highbeamministry.com, and when you go to highbeamministry.com, that's par high beams, H-I-G-H-B-E-A-M, ministry.com, click on the podcast tab, because we take all the radio shows and archive them on the podcast, so you can go back and literally take all of these episodes that we've done from the beginning of Revelation all the way through it. It's going to be an extensive series by the time we get done. And like you said, we're going really slow through here so that we unpack the meanings behind it. And a lot of that has to do with Jewish context, and it has to do with other parts of the Bible. And so we're trying to pull both of those things together to make this amazing book just pop. So highbeamministry.com, go to the podcast. And by the way, we have 375 plus episodes on the podcast. So if you want to go beyond Revelation to other Bible studies or topics, it's a lot of fun stuff. Okay, so now that we've got the commercial out of the way, you wanted to do a (laughs) recap on some of the uh, things where we have covered already. And I have a question, which I have been holding on to since last week, but go ahead. Okay. So here's the recap. When we're jumping into chapter 7, the trumpets begin to blow. Now, these trumpets are in a Jewish context, in a biblical context, they would be thought of as the shofarim. A shofar is the ram's horn trumpet. So shofarim is plural, and these trumpets announce and release God's judgments, and they are against the earth and rebellious humanity. It is time to judge the earth. Now, some righteous people will be spared. There are 144,000 Jews who will be sealed from harm so that they can complete their evangelism task, and these are messianic Jews. These are Jews that are believers and followers of Jesus, and they will complete the task that God had given to Israel to be a light unto the nations. However, and here's the caveat as you go through Revelation, this is not a pleasant message for some people because some righteous people, according to chapter 7, verse 14, will die during the Great Tribulation. 
This great tribulation is also called the time of Jacob's trouble, which means all of this tribulation stuff is really focusing on Israel and the Jewish people. These other people who are dying around the world will be dying in martyrdom and as a result of the cataclysms that are hitting the earth. But not to worry that God spares these people. He guards them and he protects them through death so that they will be with him forever. When we hit chapter 8, the shofar and trumpet sound and God's judgments begin. And what we said last time was that they parallel the plagues of the Egyptian exodus. So it's things like water turning to blood, which means water is dying. Or you see hail mixed with fire or darkness or locusts. You see these things popping up again in Revelation. So with that in your head, that begins to color what the tribulation is about. It is God attacking the pharaoh of this world who will be the antichrist and he will be judging the kingdom of darkness exodus or a fallen world with his judgments in order to bring his revelation to the world and for the world to release and to let go and stop harming god's people it is literally kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of light and as we know from the exodus story god wins and so in revelation what happens god wins so in these judgments a third of the trees, earth, and grass are burned. In the second trumpet, a third of the oceans and sea life dies and ships are destroyed. So that's a salt water attack. A third of the fresh water is poisoned and rendered undrinkable in the third trumpet. And in the fourth trumpet, a third of the heavens are affected. The cosmos are affected. The sun is darkened. Moon, stars also darkened. Day and night are dimmed by a third. So as you can tell... Unless God stops this, the earth will become uninhabitable. That's where a great many people will be dying in these cataclysms. And now we hit chapter 9. And this is where your question kind of emanates from, because you see an angel coming down and unlocking a thing called the abyss. And out of this abyss comes these really strange-looking creatures. And these strange-looking creatures have the ability to torture people, but not kill them. And so this is going to be uh, literally a demonic attack against humanity, specifically those who are rebelling against God. It's targeted toward them. Okay, now for your question. Well, my question is, I remember for years people talking about there are demons locked up in this bottomless pit that are too dangerous or too evil to be let loose on the earth until the end time. I don't know if that's true or not. I know that Second Peter has some reference to something like that. But there are references to the abyss, the bottomless pit, which we'll talk about today, Tartarsus, Gihana, the lake of fire, and outer darkness. These are all references to the underworld. What about this bottomless pit and there are demons locked up that aren't able to be released until the end? Okay, I'll give you a thumbnail sketch as I understand this. Now, where did this bottomless pit come from and who are these spiritual beings locked up in it? This goes all the way back to Genesis 6 when the spiritual beings named the Watchers came down and they wanted to consort with human beings and in essence let's let's be a little bit oblique with this they wanted to consort with human women and do what human beings were doing because we were tasked as a human race to procreate in order to fill the planet evidently these angels said hmm that's something we'd like to try and so they came down consorted with women and the hybrid from these angelic beings these spiritual beings and human women created these monstrosities called the Nephilim. And these Nephilim were giants. They were not just giants in physical form, but they were giants in their rebellion. And they were just absolutely horrible beings. And they were eventually killed in the flood, but we do see giants appearing after the flood. Now that's a different, you can go to the, the podcast tab because you and I did a program on this specifically focusing on the Nephilim. Okay, well if you go to extra biblical writing, such as the book of First Enoch, that gives us a little more information that was in the Jewish mind about that event. And what that event says is that God tells Enoch that he's going to destroy the Nephilim in the flood, and then he's going to take these angelic beings, these spiritual beings called the Watchers, that committed this great sin, and he was going to bind them in a deep, dark 
prison, this is where you get the abyss. And these beings will be in this deep, dark prison until the day of judgment. Now, it's an interesting take on this I've heard from different teachers. Number one, they will be consigned to this place until they are judged, or they are consigned to this place until God wants to use them to judge the earth as, you know, just kind of let the convicts loose and run havoc over the earth and then judge them. So there's two ways of looking at it. And as I usually say, I'll let you know when we get there. (laughs) We do know for a fact is that this is where the abyss is. It's not for human beings, it's for these spiritual beings, and it's their prison for what they did by consorting with humanity. So evidently, the abyss also holds, let me put it this way, when they're released, they're either going to be like these beings that we see in chapter 9 here, these scorpion, sting, locust-type beings that come up, or there may be other spiritual beings that have also been imprisoned there that will be released at this time. So that's the conjecture. Now, those spiritual beings are different from demons today. And if you go into the Jewish writings, the demons of today, the disembodied spirits, are the spirits of the Nephilim. They were killed, but what happens to their spirits? Well, their spirits are free roaming, and this is where we get the demons of today. And they're looking to embody and influence human beings again. It was just like the angelic watchers wanted to consort and become a part of humanity and procreate, so the Nephilim have this desire to again inhabit a human body, which is why when Jesus was driving out the demons, they said, oh, we don't want to, we don't want to just wander in the, the waterless place. You know, we need to, we need the warmth and the moisture of a body, I guess you could say it that way. And so Jesus said, okay, you know, go to the pigs like you asked. And so they went into the pigs, the pigs died anyway, and they're still disembodied, so there. So they lose. So this is where we're seeing these spiritual beings bound in the abyss and free-roaming demons of Nephilim. Well, we don't... Help? Yeah, it does. I, I mean, there's a lot more that could be unpacked. First of all, we're, we're using references not to Scripture, but to extra-biblical writings that right. are in history, and we're just saying, hey, this is what we find there. We're not saying that this is Scripture, as well as... I always thought, Dr. J, that the demons of today, I, because it came to my mind when you were talking about the Nephilim, they were demons that were angels originally, and fell with one third of the angels from heaven when Satan was cast out. But now you're saying that perhaps some of these demons of today were the spirits of Nephilim. I've never heard that before. Right. And as far as the third of the angels that fell, that could be the angels that are kept in Tartarus. Once again, Scripture's not totally clear about this. You know, the angelic beings that fell with Satan could be part of the spiritual beings that will afflict the earth during the tribulation, because it says Satan is cast out of heaven. Well, something to think about is in the book of Job, Satan still has access to God's throne. So this Satan being cast out of heaven with a third of the angels could be a future event, not a current event. There's some dispute regarding this, so we'll have to kind of deal with this as we come across it. You you have a really funny look on your face right now. Well, no, I just, I don't want to get off track. And, and when you can go on these rabbit trails, I just think that since we're dealing with the bottomless pit in chapter 9, it conjures up all these other thoughts in my head. Because, you know, we all get taught things over the years. Some things were right, some things not so right, right? So that's why I wanted to ask you to get some clarity. Thank you for that. Right, but here's the important point. What you asked about the abyss, we do know from Peter and from Jude that these watchers were put in to the abyss, and that's where they're kept. And it's not for human beings. Human beings have their own holding tank. According to Jewish thought, all dead people went to Sheol. It's the place of the dead. And it was divided into two compartments, one for the wicked, one for the righteous. The one for the righteous was called Abraham's bosom or paradise. And when Jesus died and cleared the way for people who died in faith, to now come into God's presence, when Jesus resurrected and ascended into heaven, it says he led captives in his train, or he led a parade, so to speak, of now saved people 
who could come into God's presence. So now what do we have? The holding tank of the dead, which is called hell, and you now have paradise, which is in God's presence in heaven. And that's where the righteous are. And the wicked are in hell, awaiting their judgment like the angels in Tartarus. There you go. <laughs> I love you. You're so good with that. And I know we could go on all day, but we can't because we have a time frame. So let's get to chapter 9 of the book of Revelation. Okay, so we're talking about these beings that came out of the earth. They cause a torment through a scorpion sting, which is, as we talked about last time, very brutal. Then this would be chapter 9, verse 6. In those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. So this is going to be a torturous time for the people that don't belong to God. It goes on to describe these things, whatever they are. The appearance of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. Now, a horse prepared for battle means it has some type of armor on it. But once again, when we're talking about descriptions, Hebraically, you think function rather than just description. So rather than thinking about armor, we should say they are prepared for battle. This is a war against humanity. It says something like golden crowns was on their heads, so they had some type of authority to do this. Their faces were like human faces. They had hair like women's hair. Their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had chests like iron breastplates. Now that could be linking back to the battleground thing. The sound of their wings was like the sound of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. And they had tails with stingers like scorpions, so that with their tails they had the power to harm people for five months. They had as their king the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he has the name Apollyon. The first woe has passed. There are still two more woes to come after this. So let's kind of unpack this a little bit. Okay, the really interesting part on this to me is John is describing what he's seeing, but he doesn't know what they are. And of course, a lot of Bible prophecy people say, well, if we go by the description, it sure sounds in some way like he's talking about helicopters. And if you look at Apache helicopters, could that be a possibility? Absolutely. On the other hand, they could really be spiritual beings that look like this. And again, we have to be careful that we don't get dogmatic about our conclusions. We have to wait until they actually happen. Once again, prophecy is best judged looking backwards. So when this event happens, if we're around, we should be able to go, aha, that's exactly what John was talking about. So now we know what's going on. And that's a good way to approach prophecy. Okay, this demonic army has a king named Destroyer, which is what it means. And what's his function? The function is to destroy. And so he's the leader of this destroying army, but it's not going to be a quick destruction. It's going to be a drawn out destruction. This army is on a search and destroy mission, but death will elude their victims. By the way, this is getting intense already. This is only the first woe. Okay, so let me put this together. Trumpets 1 through 4 introduce things that destroy a third of humanity and the environment. You get to 5, 6, and 7, those are called woes. Again, as we've said, a woe is like a judgment pronounced upon people. The opposite would be a wheel, W-E-A-L. It's an old English term meaning a blessing. So a curse is a woe. A wheel is a blessing. The last three, this is a woe, a judgment in triplicate, and you do not want to be on the receiving end of this. This is just the first one. Okay, so let's go to the second woe, which is the sixth trumpet. The sixth angel blew his trumpet, and from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God, and by the way, I want to point this out. It says in the book of Hebrews that Moses built the tabernacle that he saw when he was on the mountain in God's presence. So the tabernacle, and the way it's laid out, and later the temple, as it's laid out exactly like the tabernacle, reflects God's throne room that Moses saw. So now John is seeing in heaven the same thing Moses was seeing. And what does he see? A golden altar that is before God. The golden altar in the tabernacle and temple was the place where incense was placed and a cloud goes up before God representing the people's prayers. So from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God, I heard a voice say to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, this is chapter 9, verses 14, release the four angels angels bound at the great river Euphrates. So now we're getting a heavenly decree 
saying it's time to release four spiritual beings that are kept bound at the river Euphrates. We'll talk a little bit about that. So the four angels who were prepared for the hour, day, month, and year were released to kill a third of the human race. Now, how are they going to kill them? Verse 16 says, the number of mounted troops. Aha! So these four angelic or spiritual beings are going to facilitate a war. The number of mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. This is how I saw the horses and their riders in the vision. They had breastplates that were fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. The heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and from their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of the human race was killed by these three plagues, by the fire, the smoke, and the sulfur that came from their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, because their tails, which resemble snakes, have heads that inflict injury. Boy, is there a lot to unpack here. Do you have any questions before I jump in? No, I, I'm just kind of mesmerized by what's going on here. I mean, this is really a battle scene, right? And that's the exact point I want to make. In our heads, we should start seeing seeing a grand battle taking place. So here we go. John describes what the soldiers or their equipment looks like, but what grabs me is how they kill people by fire, smoke, and sulfur. Now, I don't know about you, Amazing Larry, but this sounds like horrific nuclear warfare in the Middle East. Are there tactical nukes being used at this point? I don't know. But think about this. When Pharaoh saw Egypt afflicted by the devastating plagues, he repeatedly hardened his heart. The Lord also hardened Pharaoh's heart because it was time to judge Egypt. And the Lord did it again to cause Pharaoh to chase the Israelites into the Red Sea to his death. However, Pharaoh repented for a brief moment and obeyed God after his son died. So in Revelation 20 through 21, not even the horrors of death around him will cause these wicked people to turn to God. So this is where we stopped. The rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands to stop worshiping demons of idols, of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which cannot see, hear, or walk. And they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immoralities, or their thefts. So, what we see unlocked here is that at a certain point in the Great Tribulation, war is going to break out, centered around the River Euphrates, or at least starting with the River Euphrates. And from there, it's going to move out. There will be 200 million, and let's be fair, 200 million in Hebraic thinking means a lot of people. Yeah. It can literally mean 200 million, but 200 million, John hears the number. So it's a vast army that's going to take place. And it's either an army or a collection of armies. And from that point in the Middle East, it's going to expand outward. And it sounds like there could be a tactical nuclear war actually happening in the Middle East and spreading toward Egypt, spreading toward Asia, up into Asia, to the east, maybe upwards toward Europe, and then down into Africa and Saudi Arabia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, is that off the mark? Not necessarily, because if we are right in our assessment that the Antichrist could be from an, a revived Islamic empire as opposed to an, a revived Roman empire, then that would once again focus on the Middle East, particularly Babylon in Iraq and Saudi Arabia in Mecca and Medina. So that's kind of what I'm anticipating as I'm looking for an Islamic coalition to come together that wants to start a caliphate, but yet According to Daniel, this ten-toe coalition won't hold together. It'll be a brittle alliance, and then warfare will break out amongst them. And literally, according to John, all hell breaks loose right. in the Middle East, and it gets crazy. Yeah, well, you know, we have to hold it a little bit loosely. It's good to talk about yep. these things, whether it's the Antichrist is Muslim or, you know, from the old Roman Empire. We don't know. I mean, there are Bible teachers that have supposedly evidence about this, but we just have to hold it a little bit loosely. Now, before we end here, I just want to say this, is that what I'm amazed at this is that even though devastation is happening, judgment is happening on the people of this area, people of the world, they aren't repenting. They aren't, they aren't thinking about, oh my goodness, this is God doing this. I should probably get right. Their hearts are so darkened, so evil, they don't care. They just go on doing what they have always done, 
which is live in immorality. Yeah. And that's what this end of this chapter talks about. So, well, we'll pick it up again next week. But in the meantime, we want people to know more about High Beam Ministry, the Truth Barista, and Dr. Jay Christensen. That's what we want to kind of find out a little bit. So what do you have to say? Well, thank you, Amazing Larry, for that <laughs> wonderful pitch. As uh, the president of High Beam Ministry, it's my pleasure to bring this program to you. And for those who are listening, if you want more information about High Beam Ministry, Go to highbeamministry.com and check out the variety of offerings. We have the radio show. It tells you where we're on the radio, especially this station. And it has an archive of all of our previous radio shows and podcasts. Go to that tab. We have a tremendous Through the Bible in a Year 12-book series, one for every month. And in each of the books, it has a day. And for that day, it's what the reading is for that day. And it's usually about two or three chapters in the Bible. It's pretty easy. And then I include a commentary to help you understand, get a little bit more into what you've just read to understand God's Word. So be sure to check out Cruising Through the Bible One Year Reading Plan and Commentary. And by the way, when you're on the site, we also are beginning to offer online video classes regarding the Feasts of the Lord as a prophetic timetable. I explore Jesus coming in the Spring Feasts and how how they're reflected on the day, and then I project forward into the fall feast saying, hmm, maybe the fall feast will tell us what Jesus is going to do when he returns. So, for example, in spring, Jesus died on Passover, rose again on the Feast of first fruits, and he ascended into heaven and sent his Holy Spirit on the Feast of Pentecost, or Shavuot. So he did that to the day. So what are the themes of the fall feasts, and how might that tell us what we're looking at relative to our study in the book of Revelation? Jesus returned, the tribulation has returned, and the messianic kingdom. Just go and check them out. Also, when you get to the website, don't forget to subscribe. Then we'll be able to notify you when more material is added. And don't forget to hit the donate button. As I say, we're on the air, but we don't live on air here. To keep going, we need your support. If you appreciate these programs, if you're benefiting, then please consider a gift of any kind. And we would greatly appreciate that. And we thank you in advance. And if you have any questions, comments, even criticisms, write to me. That's Ministry at gmail. Com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. No matter how you define our culture, we know it is not based upon truth. The lie is the greatest virus ever known to mankind. The lie has infected the church, the government, the educational system, and our media. Today, the lie has become so sophisticated, it cannot be distinguished from the truth. The message of the gospel is the antidote to the lie, and our goal is to expose the lies and present the truth of God's Word. Want the truth today? Dr. Jay Christensen is the truth barista and the founder of High Beam Ministry. Jay is a creative person who wants to use the setting of an imaginary cafe to produce a series of radio and internet programs that confront the issues of our day through the lens of the Bible. The Truth Barista was the avenue that was developed to communicate truth using the Bible as the source of our information. The Truth Barista is a production of High Beam Ministry and can be found online at highbeamministry.com.